Tonight's guest struck TV gold twice with 90210 and Melrose Place. His new show, Central Park West, brought him not only a lucrative deal, but yours truly. How lucky can Darren Starr get? Let's find out. <laughs> so now you had a very comfortable life growing up. Is that right? Is that the reason why your shows are so upscale and glossy? Comfortable. I had a, I had sort of a nice middle class life. I mean, um, I don't know. I like entertainment, and I think that I, this is the sort of certainly I can draw on experiences like my high school to a degree, but it's really about high school in general. And and I did draw on my experiences. I went. To, I lived in a in, in a comfortable suburb. It wasn't as comfortable as Beverly Hills, but um, I think that probably influenced 90210. And, and Melrose Place is sort of a fantasy of L.A. I lived in I lived in a courtyard apartment building with a pool after college with a group of people, you know, not quite as degenerate as the cast of Melrose Place. Um, but uh, it was, that wasn't actually all that comfortable. The clothes are better on Melrose Place than anything that we, you know, that we were wearing, but... You know, people get addicted. I mean, they're really, truly addicted to the show. You're sort of a drug dealer. Yeah. How does this, uh, well, I guess we'll get back into the mm -hmm. deep addictions that okay. you spread okay. across the countryside later. You start out writing films. Right. So why do you think that TV is the thing that actually clicked for you? I don't know. I was writing movies for a while, for about six years. Um, I got a break pretty young, and I really never thought about television. I never watched television. I watched movies. I was a movie fanatic. And then the opportunity to write the 90210 pilot came along, and I, at the time, I had written a movie at Warner Brothers called If Looks Could Kill, and I thought that was going to be a huge hit, and that 90210 is this little TV thing that I was kind of like, you know, I was kind of slumming in television for a while. Didn't tell people you were doing it? Yeah, just say, oh, I'm doing this little, <laughs> I wrote this TV pilot. But then it got made, it got made very quickly. What I love about television is that things happen fast. And in features, the budgets are so large, there, there are so many frightened executives that only make very few movies, and it's very star-driven, director-driven, that you can have a great piece of material that'll sit around and wait for the right star to commit, and that star can commit, and then, that, and then he or she can say, you know what, I changed my mind, and then it's and back on the shelf again. And years have gone by. Years have gone and by. years did go by. I mean, I, I had a couple things produced, but, you know, but I, I felt like I wrote a lot of good screenplays that just weren't getting produced, and I was making a nice living, but it wasn't that satisfying. And, and then when I wrote the pilot for 90210, it got shot, it got made, um, it was on the air, and suddenly we had, you know, to come up with an episode every week. And I liked you know, I like that pace. I like to sort of create. It was an adrenaline rush. Exactly. And TV is, a, is an adrenaline rush. I mean, I think you have to be up for it. It doesn't offer the sort of the luxury of filmmaking, as you know, because you're, you're doing it right now. You know, you just got, you get in there and you do it, and you just, the product sometimes is, is amazingly good for the, you know, short amount of time that you really have to get it on the screen. You somehow tapped into the um, unconscious of the country. Uh, yeah, it's kind of wild. I mean, I, I, and I did, you know, you never know what's really happening. At one point, I was watching, the ratings were dismal on 90210. I think I, I saved them. We were, we were getting like six shares. It was really sort of off the map in terms of how low the, how low the numbers were. And then I thought, well, I thought that was going to be it. I didn't think the show was going to make it through the year. And then we had this meeting with these guys at Fox, and we never wanted to go into Fox at that time because we just thought we were sort of you know, despised, and, and <laughs> we, were, we were producing this horrible little show that was getting these terrible numbers, and then we, wa we walked in, and then they, they showed us all these charts and graphs and everything, and we were getting like 65% of all the teenagers watching television were watching 90210, and I had no idea because I don't like hang out with a lot of 12-year-old girls, so I wasn't, I didn't have a sense that these guys were watching the show. Well, then why were you getting dismal shares? Well, that's not enough. It's not enough. You still, you still need more, but you know what? It kind of snowballed, and, and it, was really the, it was really the girls at the beginning, i got to be honest. The teenage boys came in after the girls, but it was sort of like all the teenage girls in the country were watching 90210 and on the phone with their friends, and, mm -hmm. and it kind of became this phenomenon that really took off when Luke Perry made some sort of appearance in a shopping mall in Florida and had to be taken out in a, you know, in a, in a, um, you know, a shop, shoe a shoebox or something <laughs> like that. They had to, they had to, they had to spirit him away so he didn't get, like, torn, torn to pieces. And it made, like, the front page of the Miami papers, and 
I was shocked. I was sitting in my house, sort of like writing the show, and I got this sort of fax came through, and this picture, and 10,000 teenage girls mob Luke Perry. And I thought, wow, someone's watching the show. That's, mm -hmm. So it kind of went from there. What happened with the cast after that happened? Well, they were all waiting to get mobbed in shopping malls. You know, they were waiting for their <laughs> turn. But uh, no, the cast was really, I mean, it was nice in a sense that we did the show in a vacuum almost. Mm -hmm. We didn't. We just figured no one was watching anyway, so we were going to do exactly what we wanted to do, and nobody really was paying that much attention. And there was a time when I saw maybe the 12th episode of, of the series, and Jenny Garth, who's a terrific actress, was... Uh, there was a slumber party show, and all the girls were sort of sharing their deep, dark secrets, and she was talking about how she'd been date-raped by this, by this quarterback who she really had this thing for, and when they finally got together, he kind of date-raped her. And the camera was sort of pushing in on her face, and she was crying, and she was telling, uh, she was sort of telling the story. And I thought, you know, if I were a teenager flipping, flipping through, you know, channel surfing, and I saw this, stop. I would stop mm -hmm. and watch because it was kind of, it was kind of riveting. And you would get your ideas just from things that happen in your school, or just, uh, you know, I, I don't think it comes so much from what happens to you as from after once the characters are created, imagining what would happen in the lives of these characters. You know, I think you really project yourself into this imaginary world and into the lives of these imaginary characters. And then the actors are really outside of the imaginary world and they are informed every week what's going to happen to them? They're, I don't, yeah, because they are such a part of the imaginary world that just like their characters, they, you wouldn't want them to know too far in advance what's going to happen like life, next, otherwise. like life, exactly, exactly. In our show, in Central Park West, I don't tell uh, you anything. I know you don't. <laughs> it's really annoying. I thought if I could get you on the show, you see. I right. <laughs> but it is really fun every right. week to go on the set and find out what Ron's about to do to me, what my husband's going to do, or who he's doing to other people. Right. What he's doing. Or what you're about to do to somebody. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, the amazing thing is I had no idea you were that young. I mean, look what you 34. get to do. Why you get, you get to push young? around me. Why did you that's young? I know. 34 is really young. Really, really, really young. I mean, you're just sort of getting a handle on being an adult. Uh, true. You. I think it's amazing how much you've done in such a very short time. What do you think uh, drove you? It's like you've had a missile up your butt. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is like I've had a missile up my butt. It's a very good way of putting it. That's how it's felt. We've done so many episodes on 90210 and Melrose Place. We do 32 episodes each season, which is a huge number of shows. And we hardly get any, any breaks. And after the first year of 90210, it was exhausting. And we had this meeting with the Fox executives when they were liking us a little bit more. And um, they said, gee, we want you to come. And I was ready to drop. And they said, we want you to come back. We want you to debut July 11th, which meant that we were already behind in terms of getting the show oh. up for this second year. Mm. And so my big vacation was like going to Hawaii for four days with another producer of the show and, and working on the show. And, and then the following year, I had the chance to do Melrose Place. And I thought, well, I can't, I can't turn this down because the, the time is now to do this. And then the time was now to do Central Park West. So. All right, we're going to come back and dig in here some more. Um, we'll be right back with Darren Starr. You think we'll be together forever? Starr, both of your previous mega hits came from your life's experience, in a way. Now, New York doesn't. This comes more from your imagination. Yes or no? Yeah, no, it, it does. I, I haven't lived in New York extensively, but I'm fascinated by New York in general. So it's more, it's more following my my fascination than my experience this time, which is great because I, I kind of feel like I'm, my life every day, my, my day to day life is being put into my creativity, which Fabulous. is, which is great. I, and I, and I see it happening, you and know. what New Yorker gets to move here and that happens to them immediately. Yeah. I mean, at my birthday party, George Plimpton was at my birthday party. He just happened to show up. And I said, you know, you should really be yourself on, you should come on the show and, and, and be like a, you know, a writer who's sort of disgruntled with Meryl Hemingway because she's killing your piece in the magazine. He said, I'd love to do that. Good. And so, you know, that, that sort of stuff is going on, which is neat. I have a whole bunch of friends I could, like, Bring come it. get in there and cause a little trouble now and get again. Get in there. Like you know, that. George Wayne, who's this gossip sure. columnist, he's right, he is just totally taken off on the show. I mean, he, he's consumed by the show. He saw the pilot. And now he wrote this one of his columns was about him at the zinc bar holding court and all the characters in the show interacting with him. That's funny. 
at the zinc bar. <laughs> and also real people that were there with him at his table, Jock yeah. Soto and just yeah. all these people. And I felt, God, this is wild. It's sort of, um, it's, it's uh, kind of crossing the line a little so bit. So we can start getting Richard Johnson in and, uh, you know, all the different people yeah. from Cindy Adams coming. So you love living in New York, huh? I do. Yeah, I'm having, I'm having a good time. Well, you got to love her. It'll eat you, I tell you. Yeah, well, That's it's... the great thing of it. It's got the energy, and I mean, you know, it's got what I want to put into the show. I mean, if I can, if I can try to capture that feeling of New York and and the intensity and the spirit, and you know, I think it's. I love Europe, and I kind of think that New York is is the most European of all American cities, and I think it's closer to Paris than it is to Los Angeles in the way people live. It's even a little close to Cairo. I yeah, mean, it's and close Bombay, to a I lot imagine. Yeah, this is very much Bombay and very, very much Calcutta. Yeah, but, but you feel that. life living in New York, yeah. and you don't feel life living in Los Angeles quite the same way. Um, mm -hmm. you, can, you can choose to ignore life yeah. in Los Angeles. Yeah. I never thought that the riots could happen in New York like they happened in Los Angeles, because in, in New York, no matter how rich or how poor you are, you're always in everybody else's face. Right, you have people to see aren't them as strangers. Yeah. yeah, you have to see them as a human and not a, a race or something. The, the, the riots in L.A. were really terrifying. I mean, it felt like the apocalypse. I remember uh, watching the city burn from my house up above sunset and then and then walking to, um, you know, to try to find, get some groceries or something like that. And the traffic was, it was bumper to bumper on sunset. It wasn't moving. It just was stopped. I mean, just stuck there. And it was about 99 degrees. And people and were pe trying to get out of the city? People were right? trying to get out of the city. They were lining up at any food place that was open, but most everything, else, most everything was closed. And you could hear people just, like, looting. And it was just, it was anarchy. And the end police the were gone. Yes, and it, it felt like the end of the world. It, it felt just like the end of the world. People were, all the car phones were dead. That, that's what was really weird. <laughs> car and phones dead in Hollywood? Car phones dead in Hollywood. <laughs> I know, because you were... They just shut it down. I don't know why, why it happened, but they just shut it down. So as you're inching home, trying to like call people and trying to figure out what's going on here, the car. F I've never heard the whole system dead before. It was, it was eerie. I guess they needed it for over the wire. I don't know. It was, it was eerie. But you're right. I don't think that could happen quite the same way. Yeah, we in have New to York. see each other as humans because we're in each other's face all day. There's no way of ghettoizing yourself like you can in L.A. Right. Why do you think Models, Inc. failed? Uh, hmm. It was a spelling spin-off of your Melrose Place, right? In a right, way? right. Yeah. yeah, I was originally approached to Models, Inc., and I said, you Me know too. what? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's why I really wanted to do for this show. <laughs> um, and I thought, I just can't, you know, the world of models, the lives of models are, to me, inherently not that, I mean, <laughs> they, for very few, they're fascinating, okay? But not all models are Lauren Hutton, but, um, you're not, I mean, that's not what, that's, you're doing a talk show. I mean, you're in a TV series. Also, you have a it, life, you It know? didn't look like any model world I ever knew or anything about. Yeah, I and, I, and I knew, I knew I just, it wasn't my, also, it wasn't my world. Yeah. And, and I knew I couldn't write it from my heart. You know, I couldn't right. write Models, Inc. from my heart the way I wrote 90210 and the way I wrote Melrose Place. And so I wouldn't know what to do. And that's what I said. I said, quite honestly, I wouldn't not, I would not know what to do with this show. And after having had two successes, I don't want, I don't want to fail. I don't want to try something that I know I'm not, that's not up my alley. And, and so somebody else did it, and basically I sort of had um, nothing to do with it. I saw the pilot, and that was it. All right, so what do you do with an actor like me, no, <laughs> that says, no, I won't sleep with my lesbian grandmother? Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> well, that, that particular incident hasn't happened yet, but anything's possible. It could be coming. Uh, it could be you, actually. I'm too old for that. I promise okay, you. Okay. If I had a lesbian grandmother, she would be, well, she'd have to be like 100 and something. Oh, okay. And I don't think there's, you know. They're not out there. Maybe one or two. No, it was very unpopular. Um, generally, that hasn't, that doesn't really happen. I mean, certainly actors will call and say, they don't really call and, and gripe about storylines. I would slap them if they did. I really would. Oh, I thought I griped already, haven't I? No. Yeah, I mean, or maybe I, have a, maybe I have a high tolerance for what constitutes griping. I'm willing to listen, you know, but it doesn't mean that anything is going to change. No, but I'm certain, changed so well. Yeah, <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll listen, and I think, you know, just the way, I, just the same way I would never get on the set and, and give line readings for an actor, you know, you, there's got to be a, a sort of a bond of trust established between an actor and a writer-producer that 
I'm going to write something that is going to, it's going to work. And if it doesn't, the show's going to fail anyway. It's going to be off the air. But if the show's successful, then there's got to, then, you know, then there's got to be some sort of mutual trust going on because it means the writing's there and then the acting's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I think, they, I think the actors, from what I can see, they do trust you because they are, it, it is fun. It's really fun. Yeah. And I didn't expect it to be fun. And, uh, should be fun. I should sort of did fun. it for my own nefarious reasons. Uh -huh. And it's something that I haven't done on purpose for a very long time. Uh -huh. And I sort of was leery when I told my friends. But I told you it was going to be fun. Yes, I know you did, but I didn't know you. <laughs> right, that's so true. So I didn't. That's true. I had no idea who you were. Turn on to Lauren Hutton and Jan Sian. You won't be sorry. Monday. Your shows help put the Fox Network on the map. And now CBS has a lot riding on the success of Central Park West. Yeah. Are you feeling the pressure? I'm definitely, I'm trying not to feel the pressure. Um, because there's nothing more I can do that I'm doing. So I'm trying to have a good time. Yeah. And, you know, at least, uh, you know, if go down knowing that it was a lot of fun. <laughs> rather than <laughs> knowing that it was like a, you know, yeah. a terrible experience. Yeah. It's been a great experience. And hopefully that comes through. I think it does come through in the show. Just like when the writers sit around, you know, the writing staff of Melrose Place, we sit around and come up with these stories. I mean, we have a blast coming up with these stories. It is, we're, we're just like laughing our heads off. What's it like? You sit around in a nice room. How's it we work? Sit around, we sit around a room, just sort of a very basic room. And um, we just start talking about throwing out ideas. And every once in a while, you know, somebody throws out, you know, a, a clunker that just kind of thuds. And, but, you know, but we kind of build on each other's ideas. And there's sort of a, a you know, an energy that, that happens when the right people are together. So it's like a group storytelling? One person it tells is. part of a story yeah. and somebody else adds and our, in the story yes. and, says, and then it's all fighting back and yeah. forth about it. And it is. And, 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 and people get very passionate about their points of view and their stories and very emotional. And, you know, if somebody's, you know, somebody can have a, a story that they feel strongly about and, you know, if, if sometimes they'll get divided and then one person will be this sort of decisive person. I mean, usually that comes to me. I have to make that decision one way or another. But when it gets shot down by somebody else in the room, I mean, there can be like major writer cat fights going on. <laughs> you know, uh, I think the meek and timid writers don't generally get their voices heard. I mean, you really got to be passionate about your ideas, whether they're good or bad. I know one writer in particular was objecting. I can't remember the storyline, but I remember she was very like vociferous about saying, I hate this. This is this is illogical. I don't buy it. And I'm like, well, we're doing it because I think it's going to work. And she, I'm sure, felt the way that some other audience members felt when, when they when they saw that show. But that's okay because I just as long as it like elicits a response from people that they're not just sitting there like catatonically watching their television set and feeling nothing. They're not, and there's also a lot of complaining going on. I know about hairdos, my hairdo, for instance, at different times, about lipstick, look at what things done with her lips this day, or look at that like, outfit. Yes, and that's sort of out of my realm. I was really shocked when I, one of the first 90210s that I wrote um, that aired, I had a group of friends over to, to watch it, a lot of, a lot of women, and were, were, were there, and were watching the show, and it's over, and I'm thinking, I really thought it was ter just terrific. I thought it was a great script, and I was really into it, and I'm like, what do you think? They're saying, this dress or that dress or that hairstyle. And I'm, I'm thinking, what dress? What hairstyle? What are you talking about? And they were just going off on, on the actress's wardrobe, hair, hair and makeup and wardrobe. But see, for them, fashion is destiny or fashion yeah. is character. So they feel that if a character doesn't have this thing right or that thing right, they're just, yeah. you know, And it taught me something. It made me realize that I had to pay attention to yeah. that. And it with Central very, Park very West, important. you know, we have Jeffrey Curlin who did yep. wonderful... Uh, costume designer did all of Woody Allen's movies mm -hmm. and I wanted someone the best person I could find on the show mm -hmm. because I know that people are watching that some of the audience that's that's what they're watching they're, the story is kind of incidental they're watching the clothes they're watching the, the hairstyles what are you afraid of I'm afraid of disappointing myself that's what I'm afraid of I hate creating something that doesn't that I'm not that I'm not happy with, you know. That's a fear. But we still get out there and try it. Yeah, really, yeah. You've, you've, been, you've done it right so far. People forget failure pretty quickly once you have some success. They forget that you failed. Yeah, that's a good thing to know. Yeah. Because that keeps that would that would help people that are afraid to try. Yeah, and that was one wonderful thing about Aaron Spelling. I mean, he would always say it. when when Melrose Place was sort of in its darkest hours, 
he was always trying to like eke out a few more episodes from from Fox, and I would think, why? Just let us die let in us peace. Let us die in peace. Yes, nobody, you know, the show is not working. But that, when you know that that someone is believing in you, and 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 you're still getting that chance, it it kind of forces you to come through. Is that his genius? I mean, you know him very well. You were he was your mentor. Yeah, I think that's certainly part of his genius. Is that he um, he doesn't he doesn't accept defeat. All right, thank you very much Great. for coming. Thank you. Come again. All right. Mwah. Bye. Slick 50 protects the vital moving parts of your engine for up to 50,000 miles. Slick 50 starting your engine without it is a terrible thing to do. In a taste test of high fiber cereals, the uniquely light and crispy taste of Fiber One was preferred over these other leading brands. Fiber One, the one that tastes better. This is Jurgen's body shampoo, and this is the sponge. Just a little squeeze, there's so much lather. It tingles, it feels fantastic. Jurgen's body shampoo. <laughs> Glade Clip-Ons, the refillable air freshener designed specially for your car. Now with more freshening power. Mm -hmm.